Hi, welcome to Fermilab. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dr. Dan Bauer. He's one of the preeminent scientists working on dark matter in the world. He's going to lead us through a nice discussion on dark matter and why, why it matters. So, Dan, please. Okay, thanks for coming to the Ask a Scientist program here. Uh, as Ryder says, I'm going to try to tell you some of what I know about dark matter and why, uh, why it matters to all of us. Uh, so I'll try to talk a little bit about what is dark matter, uh, why do we believe it exists, uh, where might it be, how can we look for dark matter particles, uh, when might we find them, and what do we learn about the universe if we do find them. All right, so let's start with what is dark matter. Uh, the basic definition is it's some form of matter that doesn't emit, reflect, or absorb electromagnetic radiation, light and all different variations of light like radio waves, gamma rays. So just to picture that, you have a source of light, you have this cloud of dark matter, you have an eyeball, uh, what happens? Uh, the light just goes straight through. Uh, it doesn't bounce off, it doesn't interact in any way with the dark matter. Whereas normal matter, which is everything that makes us up and everything we know about, uh, might appear dark to our eyes, but that's because it does something different. It absorbs or reflects light. So the light didn't reach your eye and it looks dark, but that's because the, that material interacted with light, whereas dark matter didn't interact at all with light. So it may be an unfortunate name. Maybe it would have been better named as invisible matter because it doesn't interact at all with light. Okay, so when I first started uh, uh, working in this field, uh, my kids were much younger, and when I mentioned dark matter, they had a, a rather different interpretation of what it might be. Uh, this is what they thought of. Uh, Unfortunately, this guy is rather reflective and carries a lightsaber, so that's, <laughs> that's definitely not what we're talking about in dark matter. Uh, so what, what could it be when you, when you think about dark matter? What, what would you think of first? Well, what you might think of is things like black stars, stars that are dead, or rogue planets that have lost their sun and are wandering around uh, even outside of the galaxy, or dark nebulae. Uh, the problem is all of those in some way or another emit, absorb, or reflect light. So they don't qualify as the type of dark matter that we're talking about. There is a form of normal matter, neutrinos. Uh, we are now the neutrino lab. We make a lot of these. Uh, <coughs> and people originally thought of these as possibly being the dark matter uh, because they don't interact electromagnetically, just like we said that dark matter shouldn't. But <coughs> they're, in fact, far too energetic and have way too little mass to make up the dark matter. So they've already been ruled out as the, the source of, of dark matter. Uh, perhaps there's a new kind of elementary particle. This is what we do at Fermilab. We, we uh, produce elementary particles and study their properties. So maybe there's something that we haven't been able to make yet that has mass and therefore produces gravity and may interact with normal matter, but only very weakly, so that we wouldn't have seen it yet. Uh, maybe that's what dark matter is. Where would it come from? Well, uh, it could have came from the same place all matter came from, the Big Bang. So <coughs> the early universe uh, starts off here with the Big Bang, and at that point, dark matter particles could have been produced, and in fact, could be around from all that time if they're stable. Uh, normal matter was also produced then, so everything we, we know was produced and everything you see in this timeline up to the present day is charting what happened to normal matter. Uh, what we don't know is what happened to the dark matter in that period of time. All right, so uh, how does it differ from normal matter? Well, we know one way. It doesn't feel the electromagnetic force. but Let's, let's stop and ask ourselves, what is normal matter? And this is the way we particle physicists think about normal matter. There's a whole bunch of different elementary particles that make us up. Uh, most of what makes us up is the electron and, the, the, uh, and light, photon, 
and the proton and uh, neutron, which are made out of these quarks. Uh, we know all about their interactions. We use that all the time in, in work we do at Tramulab. Uh, there's also the four forces we know about, gravity, electromagnet, el electromagnetism, and the weak and strong nuclear forces. So <coughs> none of this uh, accounts for dark matter. We understand all this, and it doesn't have the properties that dark matter has. Uh, so we don't know what's over here on this side, but there could be a standard model of dark matter. There could be a table very much like this on this side with many different dark matter particles and maybe even dark forces that allow these particles to talk to one another that we would be completely unaware of. Uh, <clears throat> what we're interested in and what we can measure, possibly, is how do the two different sectors interact. So we know one way, and I'll talk about this in a minute, they both feel the force of gravity. But there may be another way. There may be a, a very weak form of interaction that allows us to sense this dark sector over here and uh, uh, allow us to know that there's dark matter interacting with us. All right, so uh, over the period of time this has been studied, and it's now close to 20 years, I guess, uh, our particle theorists have been very busy coming up with possible explanations for dark matter. Uh, this is a, uh, a logarithmic scale on both scales. so. This vertical scale tells us how frequently dark matter interacts with normal matter from almost never to very often. Oh, I keep hitting the wrong button. Sorry about that. Uh, and the, the horizontal scale is the mass of the dark matter. So just to set a scale, it's neutrino mass, which is the lightest particle we know about, the proton mass, which is uh, what makes up us, along with the neutron and then a mass of a sand grain. So you see this covers an enormous possible range of how often dark matter would interact with us and what its mass would be. Uh, it's hard to study this bigger range. This is the part that we've been able to study so far because it has <coughs> moderate interactions with normal matter and masses that we're familiar with and know how to detect in the laboratory. Uh, and uh, the, one of the favorite candidates for a long time has been generically labeled uh, WIMP, Weakly Interacting Massive Particle. Physicists love to give strange names to, to particles, and this is no exception. Uh, so dark matter uh, could be in the form of a WIMP. Okay, so I've outlined the properties of dark matter, but you're probably asking yourself, why do we even talk about this? Why do we believe dark matter exists at all? Uh, and that's because when we look out in the universe with telescopes and uh, surface arrays and everything else, we see effects that we can't account for, uh, and they're gravitational effects. So we've been looking in all sorts of different ways. Uh, we look at galaxies. We look at the cosmic microwave background. We look at the structure of the universe itself, and so on. And all of these are giving us a picture that there's roughly uh, this, this is what makes up the universe, that there, most of the uh, matter energy of the universe is actually dark energy, which we won't talk about here. But there's about five times more uh, dark matter than there is this little sliver of normal matter. So this is us. This is what we believe dark matter is, and this is dark energy. We're, we're a very small part of what's out there in the universe in this picture. Uh, so most of the matter is dark matter. The only caveat here is that this relies on, on the belief that Einstein got it right with general relativity and that we completely understand gravity. If there's something subtle we don't understand about gravity, then this could be wrong. Okay, so let's look at a few of these in a little more detail so you can see some of the, the evidence. Uh, some of the original evidence for dark matter came from studying how galaxies rotate or how galaxy clusters uh, uh, rotate. And you, you can measure the velocities of, of galaxies or stars in galaxies. And what you see is something like this. This is a typical rotation curve for a galaxy. And what, you're, what you should see if, if you're only detecting the 
the uh, stars and gas is these sort of curves. So the, rot the speed as you go farther out from the center of the galaxy should drop off. Uh, what instead the data shows is it doesn't. It stays level all the way out to the farthest extent you can see. I'm going to stop pushing this button. <laughs> <coughs> so this tells you that there's something, there's some form of matter that's keeping the speeds up all the way out as far as you can see. Uh, and that's modeled here by this thing called halo. That's actually uh, what a dark matter halo, a big sphere of dark matter would do. So <clears throat> that tells you that there's something invisible there. Uh, another way of uh, understanding that there's dark matter is something called gravitational lensing. So Einstein said that gravity makes a, uh, a well, essentially, that can even bend light. And so if you have a huge mass here, then light from a galaxy behind that mass gets bent around. And it can form rings or arcs when we look at it from this point of view. And in fact, that's what you see. Is this is a very pretty example of that, where you see the, the uh, this was actually a, a big cluster of galaxies. And you see these blue arcs. Those are background galaxies that are the, where the light is being bent around and appearing to us as, as this arc. It's not quite a ring, but it's close. The problem is that when you uh, look at the distances and the masses involved, there isn't enough matter here to do this. And in fact, when you calculate how much matter there should be, you get a picture like this. So the blue is the amount of matter it would take and the way it's distributed in, or in order to produce these arcs. And you can see that blue, while in some cases it overlaps with the bright, shiny things, in many cases there's nothing there. And so this is another reason why we believe there's a lot more mass there than is producing light. OK, so here's one more uh, type of evidence. So what this is is a simulation of two clusters of galaxies colliding, where <coughs> dark matter is, is depicted in blue. It's not actually shining blue. We're just using that as a coloring for it. And normal matter is in pink. And what you saw there is that the, the blue just passed right through. The two clumps of blue passed right through, didn't do anything. Whereas the pink got slowed down and, and, uh, because normal matter interacts with itself. And in fact, we see something exactly like that. This is not a simulation anymore. This is an example of, uh, the, uh, it's called the bullet cluster. It's an example of two clusters that have passed through one another. Uh, the pink is, uh, is a coloring, but it shows the x-ray emission from the, the gas uh, that has interacted, whereas the blue is, is a coloring of the gravitational lensing, uh, like I showed you before, how much mass there is in order to have produced the light behind it. So <coughs> again, there there's appears to be dark matter uh, everywhere we look in the universe. OK, and finally, uh, people have developed supercomputer computer simulations where you just put in dark matter and gravity. So there's no normal matter in what I'm going to show you here, just dark matter and gravity. And you start from the beginning of the universe. Uh, the time index is shown up here. That's billions of years. Uh, and this scale is about the scale that's 10 times larger than our galaxy. And so what you see evolving here uh, as time goes on is a big web where matter is clumping, dark matter is clumping together on all different scales and forming what looks like a giant spider web with knots uh, at many places. And if I let this go all the way to the, the end, you would see uh, something that is very similar to what the next frame shows, which is an actual observation uh, with the uh, telescope from Earth of the large-scale structure of the universe, where they've mapped out all of the galaxies and clusters that can be seen as far out as you can see. And you see exactly that sort of web. But this is, this is light here. This is actual, an actual observation. So what that tells us is that what we're seeing in the universe producing light has a structure very much like what you would see if you had just dark matter and evolved the universe. 
So what that means to us is that it was dark matter that actually clumped together and formed the seeds that led to the formation of galaxies. So in, in that sense, it's dark matter that's responsible for us being here at all because it enabled the galaxies to form. Okay, so if you take that and apply it locally, you know, this is the Milky Way galaxy as we know it. This is what we see when we uh, look with telescopes. <coughs> but if you want to put it in context to what it actually is, it's embedded in this huge cloud of dark matter. Uh, again, because the rotation curve shows you there's a lot of mass and because we believe that that dark matter actually was the seed that drew the normal matter in that formed the galaxy. Okay, so I've talked a lot about the, the evidence for dark matter. Let me tell you a bit about how we uh, might go about finding such, such particles. Uh, this is an example of what physicists call a Feynman diagram. Uh, you may have seen this sort of thing before. It really is fairly simple. It's just a, a diagramic, diagrammatic way of showing you how particles interact. So here the dark matter is, is depicted by this Greek symbol chi and normal matter by these quarks. And there's something that leads to an interaction between them. You can look at this diagram in many different ways. So if you look down on this diagram, you're, you're looking at, I hate this thing. Uh, you're looking at uh, uh, dark matter uh, colliding with another dark matter particle and producing normal matter. Uh, so you could look for that by looking out in space. You know, I said that the Milky Way is embedded in this huge dark matter halo, so there are dark matter particles out there. Uh, they, they should find them each other and collide and produce normal matter. So you could look where you expect to see a lot of dark matter and see the, uh, these normal matter particles. That's called indirect detection because you're not directly detecting the dark matter particle in that case. Uh, if you look sideways at this diagram, then you're, you're talking about a dark matter particle scattering off a quark or a, a nucleus and the dark matter particle goes on and you see a, a, a energy given to the nucleus or, or electron. Uh, that's called direct detection because the dark matter has directly interacted in your detector. And then finally, if you look from the bottom up, you could collide normal matter particles uh, and produce dark matter particles. Uh, so you could use uh, Fermilab or now CERN to uh, collide together quarks, well, really protons and, uh, together and form dark matter. So I'm going to talk about each of these a little bit more. Uh, let me start with uh, direct detection in the laboratory. So this is a view of a crystal. The little black things are nuclei and the rods in between are supposed to represent the electrons that bind them together. Uh, so in comes a dark matter particle, uh, ironically enough in white. I don't know why they colored it that way. Uh, and out it goes, but what it did is to scatter off this uh, nucleus right here and it produced some byproducts. And in this case, what it produced is ionization, which is just kicking electrons out of an atom, or heat, which is this blue wiggling of the crystal. So that's the sort of way you would look for it, is to, to uh, look for evidence that Something has entered your detector and produced a signature that's a little bit of heat and a little bit of charge. Okay, so how do you go about designing an experiment to take advantage of that? Uh, well, <coughs> that's a very small amount of energy being deposited there. It's just a, a tiny little scattering off a nucleus. Uh, so you have to build an extremely sensitive detector to, to see that small an energy. It's roughly a billion times lower than the energy that the, the uh, accelerators generate around here. So we call it high energy physics, but this is actually low energy physics here. Uh, secondly, there's a lot of normal matter particles that are bouncing in that crystal all the time too. And they, they far outnumber any dark matter interaction. So you're gonna have to find a way to, to recognize them and suppress them. 
And you need a lot of detector mass and a lot of patience because the, we believe the dark matter density, the amount of dark matter that's passing through us, is so low that uh, with current experiments, you might affect a few of those per year. So it's a long wait to, to uh, look for your dark matter particle interacting. Okay, so let me tell you about an example. It's not a random example. It's an experiment I work on, uh, which is why I'm telling you about this one. It's called Super CDMS. Uh, it stands for Cryogenic Dark Matter Search. Uh, we've been through several phases of this, so I won't go into all the details of this sort of apparatus, but uh, there are germanium and silicon detectors that are cooled to very low temperature inside this, this huge, massive cryostat so that they're sensitive to very small energies. And I'll talk in, in a minute about how that works. And then you have to surround that with a bunch of shielding of various types to get rid of those background particles that are all around us. And I'll talk more about that too. And then you have to cool it down with a special refrigerator. Uh, and you have to go deep underground because there's a lot of uh, uh, particles coming from space in the form of cosmic rays that also can be a background. Let's talk about each of those individually. So here's my thermometer going from uh, room temperature down to absolute zero. Uh, your typical home refrigerator uh, it works with a uh, fluid that uh, can be expanded and condensed so you can take heat away from the inside and expel it to the outside. And it works very well, but it only gets you down to uh, about here. A uh, freezer will get you a bit lower, and you know, coldest winter you can imagine is, is still way up here. A dilution refrigerator, which is how we uh, do these experiments, uh, works in a very similar way, but with a very special set of, of helium isotopes that's the working fluid. Uh, but you're, again, just expanding a, a, a gas out of a fluid and condensing it back in. But here you're, you're now able to reach almost down to absolute zero. And that's crucial to, to make these sort of detectors work. Uh, OK, so why is that? Why is that so important? Uh, let me step over here and ask for a couple of volunteers, if anybody would like to come up. Okay, so you get to do the that one. Come on up. Okay, so what we have here is a heavy dark matter particle. I'm going to use you two. Uh, and a light dark matter particle. And what I have here is a crystal. So these tennis balls are the nuclei, and these springs are the electrons that hold them together. Now I'm going to have you wiggle this. All right, what is that? That's heat. That's a normal room temperature crystal. Keep wiggling. I need a lot of energy here. Uh, so that crystal is jiggling all over. Now, if he throws that dark matter particle in here, go ahead and toss it in. Didn't see anything, right? Because the thing is wiggling too much. Now, stop wiggling, but wiggle just a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. OK, throw it in again. OK, so if you cool it down, if you reduce most of the heat from the system, then a single particle interacting in the crystal releases enough heat to be visible. Now this, I said, was a heavy dark matter particle. So it generated a pretty good wiggle. Uh, go ahead and wiggle a little bit again. All right, toss that little light bar. Didn't see a thing, right? Uh, because it's still wiggling too much. It's still too warm. So to be sensitive to really light dark matter particles, we have to cool this thing down so it doesn't do anything. Now you're going to have to give it a really good toss. All right, so you see a little bit of wiggle here. That's the principle we're working on. Is thank you all for your, your help. I appreciate it. <clears throat> so that's why the cold temperatures. So to allow us to be sensitive to very small amounts of heat. Uh, this was a much better demo than my, uh, my slide transition, so we'll get rid of that one. <clears throat> All right, so another thing I mentioned is backgrounds. Uh, we have to be able to recognize and suppress backgrounds. So let me take my detector in my uh, shielded volume in an underground cavern and walk you through what are some of the backgrounds. 
So there's cosmic rays. They're high energy particles from space uh, generated from uh, supernova and, and active galaxies. Uh, at the surface, there's about one per hand per second passing through us. So they're passing through all the time. Uh, most of them don't harm us, but in fact, this is a source of radiation. So pilots get a higher dose of radiation because they, they are higher in the air and the flux of cosmic rays is higher. So we go underground to avoid this. Even underground, it's not a completely negligible, negligible problem because one of these cosmic rays can come in hit the rock and make a particle that goes into the detector. Or it can come in and hit the shielding and make a particle that goes into the detector. So we really have to be deep underground to get rid of most of these cosmic rays. The other main source of background is radioactivity. So you don't think of things around you or even your body being radioactive, but all of us and all the materials around us have a tiny amount of radioactivity. Uh, if you eat a banana, you increase your radioactivity from, the, from a potassium isotope. That tiny amount of radioactivity actually is a huge background for these experiments. So it can be in the rock, or it can actually be in the material you're using for shielding. You know, it's hard to get materials that are free of radioactivity. So it's crucial that we minimize that, that we get to ultra pure materials and we uh, have detectors that can recognize any backgrounds that, that can get into the, the detector volume. Okay, so we, I say we go deep and I mean deep. So we did the previous version of our experiment a half mile underground in, uh, in an uh, old iron mine in Sudan in northern Minnesota and we're gearing up to go a mile and a half underground at an active nickel mine in, in Sudbury, Ontario. Uh, why? Because of the cosmic ray rates. So at the surface, it's ridiculous. You have, uh, uh, like I say, one per hand per second. At Sudan, we had one per minute in our experiment. Still too much. We ran there for many years, and that was ultimately a background. It's one per day in the new lab at Sudbury. So that's why we're going there. Also, you have to have as clean a lab space as possible because you know you make clean materials, but if if you're working on an experiment, you yourself can carry the lab environment in and contaminate it. So Snow Lab, where we're going, the entire underground lab is a clean room. It's ironic. You think of a mine as a very dirty place. This is one of the cleanest places around, and it's in an active mine. But it's crucial to minimize this radioactivity problem. Uh, what's it like working underground? Uh, I'll give you a few snapshots from Sudan, and then if there's time at the end, I'll show you Snow Lab. Uh, so it's really nice to go underground at Sudan in January, <laughs> because that, that's minus 40. <laughs> uh, you spend most of the day in clean suits, because you're trying to minimize the radioactivity that you're, that you're bringing to the experiment. You meet some interesting creatures. That's a little brown bat, and he made it uh, half a mile underground. It, Sudan, and he didn't like me being there. And we get to also talk to people. So Sudan was operated as a state park, and they would bring people down, and they'd say, "What the heck are you guys doing down here?" You know, and so it was fun to tell them about it. Uh, you get to work with really cool detectors in both senses of the word. So uh, this is a photo of one of the, the detectors uh, that we use. It's a germanium detector. Uh, that's a model of it later, so if you want to look more closely, you can you'll be able to look at that. You can see the scale, and that shows you as well. This is not very big. It's a little bit bigger than this size. When we were in Minnesota, we called them hockey pucks, but they're, they're a little bigger now. <coughs> but they're specially uh, designed so that, you know, I said before, the particles hitting these crystals liberate charge and produce these crystal vibrations, heat or phonons. We pattern onto the surface of these detectors little tiny thermometers. And when you look closely on that one, you'll see there's thousands of them on there. And they're uh, at a very cold temperature, and they're right at the point where they could go superconducting or normal. So they can either lose resistance totally, or they can go normal and have their normal resistance. If you hold them right there and push the right button, uh, 
a little bit of heat in the crystal will drive that normal. And so you'll be able to see that tiny little signal. It's a very clever technology that was developed for this. And it's being used for many other things other than dark matter searches now. Uh, and if you look at the ratio of ionization or charge to phonons, as well as the position of the event in that crystal, remember I said there's lots of sensors there, so you can get some indication of where it happened in the crystal. Then you can use that to tell you where or what, what type of interaction it was. Uh, so you, you can see a typical view of uh, one of our data sets where these are events where something hit the nucleus and rattled it. These are events where something hit the electron and rattled it. And these are events on the surface of the detector. The power of the technology is to be able to separate that. And that's crucial because almost all the backgrounds come from the surface. They come from the environment outside of the detector. These germanium and silicon crystals are ultra pure because the semiconductor industry needs to have them that way. OK, so what does the raw data look like? Uh, it wouldn't look like much to you. Uh, it takes some time to absorb this. But let me point out that here was a particle hitting a detector. And so you can see that these things, which are sort of flatlined and, and jumping around a little bit, here's a signal. And it's seen in, in several different sensors on the detector. This was the heat or phonons. This was the charge showing that signal. Uh, there's some other interesting things here, too, uh, but they're not interesting for dark matter. Uh, this is a detector that's very sensitive to noise in the environment, in this case, vibration. And so this thing sits and wiggles around all the time, and it's pretty useless for dark matter. So you have to have crystals that are uh, uh, very low noise, very low vibrational noise in order to make this work as well. Uh, OK, so when you go to the 15th floor, you'll see this model for real. But I just wanted to, to show you this. Uh, this is what particle interactions would look like. So these little things here are sort of models of our detectors like that. And we've just taken our data. This is real data. And we've converted it from the very high frequencies that you saw in the previous thing to, to light and sound frequencies that you can see. So in this case, what we've done is put a radioactive source near the detector. And you see the detectors are going off like crazy because there's just a huge flux of particles. And they're going off. And it's hard to see it here. You'll see it better on the 15th floor. But they're going off in different patterns around the detectors. Uh, if you take cosmic rays, muons, you see that they come straight through and interact in a line in the detector. So you see a, a flash going through all of them. That's a signature you can recognize and discard. You know, it's not dark matter. What we normally would be doing is sitting there, and occasionally something happens. And it's almost always a background particle. But this is what we would see if we had a dark matter particle. We would see just a little flash and a, a sound, a very high frequency sound. But uh, OK, so. How do we analyze that data? Uh, so I showed you those signal traces. What we do is to uh, we understand what, what it ought to look like, because we understand our detectors well enough. So we, put a, we fit a shape to this and say, what is the amount of phonon or charge under that? And that's a measure of the energy deposited. And by looking at the different sensors, we can tell something about the position of the event. But in order to, to calibrate that, in order to really be sure what the energies are, you have to put in something that you know the energy of. And so we have radioactive sources where we know the, the energy of the particle coming in. And then we can say, all right, let, let me see what my fit would have said about that. And that you know, I'll pin the energy to that energy. OK, uh, there's a problem when you're looking for very rare events that uh, if you're trying to analyze the data and you know where the event should be, you're tempted to keep events in that region because you know that's where they ought to be and you'd really like to find dark matter. So that's a bias. And it, it can unconsciously affect anybody, even scientists that are trained to, to not be affected. So in order to uh, avoid that, 
we insert fake events. Uh, so somebody in the collaboration is designated as the, the person who throws in the fake events and only he or she knows where they're at, but they put in enough of them so that it would blind you to the presence of a small amount of, of signal and therefore you can't just tune on, on the signal events. Uh, so then the, the game afoot is to use all the information you have to reject events from background sources. Finally, at the end, once you're done, you <laughs> remove the fake events, and it's called opening the box, and you see what's left, and you see whether there's any excess that might be dark matter. So let's just look at a recent result to show how that works. Uh, these colored bands are a model of the, the background sources that we know about in the experiment. So we know how they're distributed in, in energy and position. Uh, we make a, a model and we add up all those sources. And then we compare to these black points, which is the data, and say, wow, you know, looks like the background is a pretty good representation of the data. Whereas this pink band or lavender band is what a dark matter signal should have looked like. So from that, you can see already that we're not seeing dark matter, we're seeing just the background because the, the data didn't follow what, what we would expect a dark matter signal to be. Another way of looking at it is, <coughs> is this way where I've added those fake events in and you see why that's important. If you'd allowed yourself to only look at the real events, you might have said, oh, I'm going to tune my analysis so I keep all of those events. But if I have a whole bunch of them in there, I'm not going to be able to do that. Uh, so there's a particular range in, in this heat energy versus ionization where we know dark matter ought to appear. Uh, the gray points are outside of that dark matter band and we uh, do all our analysis. We remove the fake events and we see what's left. Now did we detect dark matter here? No, because you see all these gray points. They're still a background in the signal region. So we didn't do as good a job as we would have liked to get rid of the background here. And so we can't say, well, there could be dark matter there, but we can't say that there is because there's still background there as well. So what do we do in that case? Uh, well, we make a plot like this where we're plotting the, the measured, the, the rate of interaction of dark matter with normal matter versus mass again. And okay, we say, we found events, but they're consistent with background. They're not a dark matter signal. So that allows us to draw this curve on here. And what it's doing, it's called an upper limit. It's saying dark matter is not found at rates of interaction with normal matter that are that high and with that mass. So this region up here, we've ruled out. We say we didn't find dark matter there. But dark matter could still be here, and we wouldn't have noticed it because we had too big a background. That, in fact, is what's happened with all of the current dark matter experiments so far, is they've set upper limits. We, we haven't found it yet. Uh, it takes a lot of people to do these experiments, so it's not just me. Uh, it's roughly 100 people in Super CDMS, and all of the collaborations have between 30 and 150 people uh, doing this sort of work. And you see, you know, we're, we're all over the world, all over the U.S. and in Canada and, and some other parts of the world as well. Uh, like I say, there's a lot of similar experiments worldwide using different technologies. So some, some groups use uh, liquids, uh, liquid xenon or liquid argon to detect dark matter. Others use bubble chambers, which is an old technology that was pioneered here, but has, was resurrected for dark matter searches. Uh, there's people who use scintillating crystals, another old technology. Uh, and there's people that use CCDs, like in cameras, uh, to look for dark matter. So we're, we're trying every possible technology we can, uh, we can do to find this. There is another technique that one could use. Uh, so we're moving through the galaxy, and I said there's a dark matter halo. So from our point of view, you can think of that as a dark matter wind. You know, here we are moving through this and generating a, a wind blowing at us. If only we could feel it. 
Uh, but the Earth is also rotating around the sun. And so at different times of the year, the Earth's velocity either adds a little bit or, or subtracts a little bit from the motion of the solar system around the galaxy. What that does is create a small difference in the rate that dark matter would interact with, with normal matter because it's really just the dark matter particle with a velocity that it has bumping into a nucleus. Well, if it's a little less, it gives it a little bit less energy. If it's a little more, it bumps it a little harder. That's an effect that, in principle, you could detect. And there is one experiment that says they've seen it. This nice little sinusoid is a seasonal variation of the rate that's seen in that detector over many, many years. And their claim is, oh yeah, we've seen dark matter because it follows that expectation. Uh, the effect is very small. It's only about 2% change in rate over a year. And it's not the only thing that changes seasonally. So it's <coughs> hard to accept. And the biggest problem is no other experiment has seen the effect. And uh, other experiments should have been sensitive enough, including ours, to have seen it. So this is the way science works. Uh, we don't believe it's dark matter because only one experiment has seen it. There are other possible explanations. And you really have to verify it in order to believe that something as astounding as dark matter has been seen. Uh, you could take that concept a little further. So there's another uh, rotation you could think about, which is the, the daily rotation of the Earth. So if you have a detector uh, sitting on the Earth's surface and you have this galactic wind from dark matter, uh, then as it hits the detector at different times of the day, it could cause the uh, recoils from dark matter hitting it to go in different directions. So if you could sense that direction difference, uh, you'd be in good shape, you'd think. The problem is you have to see several dark matter particles per day in order to make that work. And we haven't seen one in, in looking for 20 years. So <coughs> this may be a technique that would be used if we start to see dark matter particles. But you have to envision something the size of Wilson Hall to to get that sort of rate. Uh, detectors that big are being built. In fact, uh, you'll hear a bit more about the neutrino detectors that are, the Termi Lab is building in South Dakota. So it's not impossible, but it would be a challenge. Let's talk briefly about the other ways of detecting dark matter. So I talked about indirect detection at the beginning. The idea here is that dark matter particles may be sitting there in the center of the galaxy, finding each other colliding, annihilating, and producing normal matter particles, some of which get to us. Uh, the problem is other things are sitting in the center of the galaxy, like pulsars, uh, that can also produce such particles and come to us. So the challenge is to try to say, am I seeing more such things than I should have? <coughs> There's lots of different ways of looking for this. Uh, there's a detector in space sitting on the International Space Station. That's trying to detect antimatter. There's a satellite trying to detect gamma rays. You're looking for interactions that produce photons or electrons. You can put telescopes or detectors on the Earth's surface and look for protons or gamma rays that make showers. And you can see the showers. Or you can bury detectors in ice or water, uh, like at the South Pole ice, for example, or the Mediterranean. There are detectors in both places. There you're looking for neutrinos. But in all cases, you're looking for particles where there's an excess of them coming from some place where you believe there's a big concentration of dark matter. And you don't believe that there's a lot of other things that could produce those particles. That's the game of foot, is model, model all the sources you can think of and see if there's excess events. Uh, it's as good as your modeling. If you don't understand the distribution of pulsars, for example, then you're not going to know that you've detected dark matter. Uh, there's lots of different ones. I'm just going to flash these up because I don't want to completely run out of time. But there's many different collaborations looking uh, from space, from the South Pole, from the desert in Africa, to this International Space Station looking for this sort of thing. Uh, finally, you can make dark matter on Earth. So you could collide. We used to collide protons and antiprotons here. Uh, and you could make dark matter and normal matter particles coming out of that. Or you could take a beam of protons and shoot it into a target. 
And again, you could potentially make dark matter particles and normal matter particles. But how do you uh, detect the dark matter particles if you do that? Uh, because this is a typical, I think this was a Higgs event actually, but this is what happens in a collider. You produce this enormous swarm of normal matter particles. How are you gonna know in all of that that you've also produced the dark matter particle? Well, you can't see it. It's not gonna interact, at least very rarely. Uh, <coughs> but what it's gonna do is carry away some of the momentum or the energy. And so you have to look for something missing. You have to add up all of this swarm of particles here and say that doesn't add up to what I put in, what I used to, to uh, collide the event in the first place. And then you have to say, okay, if I do enough of these and I find something missing in a lot of them, <coughs> does that mean I've detected dark matter? It's as good as your detector and your analysis. So it's, it's not a straightforward thing by any means, but they're doing it. Uh, we did it here when we were a collider and, and CERN is doing it with the two big collider experiments. Uh, this is a typical result. It's a very similar sort of scheme where you model in these colored bands are models of all the different normal processes that would produce that signature. And then you look at the data and say, hmm, follows that color band pretty well, doesn't it? And I don't see anything excess. I don't see anything missing here. So we didn't find dark matter in this case. Uh, but they're continuing to, to look at CERN and you may have to just run a lot longer or be produce higher beam energy in order to find it. Okay, so what will we learn if we detect dark matter particles? Well, so in particle physics, we'll answer the question, do dark matter particles exist? Yes, if we find it, then, you know, we found a new particle that we didn't have in our standard model. Are they stable? Well, they must have been, if they were produced in the Big Bang and we're detecting them now, they must have been stable for 13.8 billion years. So that's pretty stable. What theory would, would you construct to fit that? Well, the theorists would go crazy. Uh, they would come up with all sorts. In fact, they do already, but uh, they would go even crazier. But you'll have to have a lot of particles before you can really tease out fully what they found. But in the end, it's gonna to lead to a more complete theory of particle physics. There's something beyond the standard model that we will learn about. Cosmology, so you know, what is this missing piece that we call dark matter? If we detect it in the lab, we know it's an elementary particle. Uh, that's because that's what we're looking for. Uh, what does it imply about the early universe? Well, we'll understand a lot better the interplay of dark matter and this other mysterious thing called dark energy. If we understand, if we detect dark matter, we'll, uh, we'll know more about what was there in the early universe. So that's really the, what we gained in cosmology. And finally, uh, in astrophysics, we'll learn about the dark matter distribution in our galaxy, although that will take a lot of events to, to tease out. And we'll understand better how dark matter exactly played into galaxy formation. Uh, so we'll understand how we got here, basically. Okay, so in the end, why do we do these experiments? Uh, the physics I find is fascinating. And I can't imagine a more fundamental question than trying to tease out what's most of the matter in the universe that we can't see by light. Uh, really challenging detector technology. So in high energy physics, we live for this. We love to build complicated detectors and make them work. Uh, and it's certainly complicated detectors to do this physics. Uh, and it's hard to beat working in deep underground mines or the South Pole or in space, uh, although Fermilab and CERN are, are cool places too. So, and finally, it's just fun to tell people about, uh, at least it has been for me. So let me just end with the fact that on, on October 31st is Dark Matter Day. It's the second International Dark Matter Day. And uh, you should take advantage of that, look for events around you. Here's the, the website if you wanna look for that. Uh, and here's some more websites you can look if you want to learn more about this subject. So I'll stop there and call for questions. Thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. Do we have any questions? We have one right here.
forgive me because you probably said it, but I'm still, I'm not clear why, how you know 75, 90% of the matter in the universe is dark matter. Is it because of the motion of the galaxies? No, it's a good question, and I didn't cover it because it's, it's a bit of a long story. So you piece together all of those different pieces of information, the rotation curves, what you see in the cosmic microwave background, and then you add all those up, and you, you make a model that says, what, would, what amount of dark matter uh, compared to normal matter would it take to explain all those as a whole? That's how we come up with the fact that 85% of the matter is dark matter. So you said towards the beginning that dark matter uh, maybe, excuse me, provided the seed for matter to come together as galaxies. But I thought by definition they didn't interact. No, that's and also an excellent question. So uh, the way that worked is that dark matter does feel gravity, right? So there were tiny little fluctuations after the Big Bang that, that left small amounts of matter clumped, including dark matter. Dark matter provided the gra gravity that started to grow those clumps, like that simulation I showed you that made the big web. The reason that dark matter is good at that and fast at that is that it, it's only feeling gravity as far as we know. Normal matter, if you try to pull it together, will scatter and you know throw pieces of it off. And it isn't very good at cooling down and collapsing. Dark matter just feels gravity, so it collapses down. And once it collapses enough to make a gravity well, then it pulls in normal matter. That's the way we believe it worked. Yes? Um, if gravitational effects are the only things we've observed in dark matter, how can we predict these particle interactions that you showed in the Feynman diagram? Uh, that's another excellent question. And the honest answer is we can't. Uh, so it's been guided by the fact that <coughs> all the particles we know have other types of interactions. And so we presuppose that dark matter may have them too. But in the end, we could be wrong. We could, there could be no other interaction between dark matter and normal matter other than gravity. And so these experiments could, in fact, never find uh, what we're looking for. That is a possibility. The reason we're optimistic is that uh, uh, there are theories of particle physics where the particles would, would uh, high energy particles would constitute the dark matter, like you may have heard of supersymmetry. That's a theory of particle physics that says every normal matter particle has a partner. Uh, one of those partners, the partner of the, the photon, is a natural candidate for dark matter. It would have all the properties that we expect it to have. And it would interact with normal matter. So there are some theories that say, you know, we're not completely wasting our time looking for this. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's always a gamble in, in this sort of game. You don't know what you're looking for. And you're guided by uh, theory. You're guided by past experience to try to make these experiments. Yes? <clears throat> One more time, the distinction between dark matter and dark energy. Uh, yeah, I didn't really explain that. So dark matter is actually matter. It uh, feels gravity. Dark energy, uh, the only thing we know about it is it's some sort of uh, repulsive force that's accelerating the universe faster than it should. So we don't think there's any connection between dark matter and dark energy, despite the name. Yeah, we want to get this on tape. Is there a way to predict what type of particle would be created from a um, dark matter and a normal matter um, collision? Uh, no. The dark matter particle colliding with normal matter uh, normally wouldn't produce any other particles because dark matter is not moving very fast, and so it doesn't really have enough energy to produce other particles. If you made a dark matter particle in a collider, it might have enough energy to make another particle. But the type of things that we're looking for, the dark matter is moving along at a, a relatively slow speed. First of all, thank you for sharing what you shared. I, sure. All okay. new to me. I'm not a physicist or a scientist in any way. He is. <laughs> um, so my question is how 
get based on the progress that you and all these other scientists all over the world are making, uh, how far away do you think it is before we do identify dark matter? Yeah, that's an excellent question, and one we ask ourselves a lot. <laughs> I'm, I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the theory I mentioned, supersymmetry, uh, would have indicated we should already have seen dark matter. So in that sense, we were all disappointed not to have seen it in the previous generation of experiments. And they're equally disappointed at the LHC, where they expected to produce it already. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not there. It just may mean that that's not the theory that, uh, that is, is reality. Uh, there is uh, a region just below us right now, but where we're about to reach, where other theories say it ought to be there. And those theories are equally viable. So that gives us some belief that it's just around the corner. But we're optimists. You know, we, we like to think that we're going to find what we're looking for. One last question. Thanks. Um, just clarification. When you say that dark matter feels gravity, do you mean that it is subject to gravity and that it also has its own gravity? Yes, it has both. It, it produces gravity and it feels gravity. So it is mass, just like other mass. And it interacts with gravity just like normal matter. If there's a few minutes, uh, could I play the Snow Lab Please. video? I think this would be interesting to you because it gives you a very keen sense of what it's like to do these experiments underground. Your visit to Snow Lab starts in the early morning at Creighton Mine, near Sudbury, Ontario. The surface building hosts offices, laboratories, and support services. It's here where you begin to gear up. The process starts in the dry, a name given to the shower and change rooms. This is what you do it's every day. It's here when you change into your clothes for underground, normally shorts and a t-shirt, as the temperature underground can easily reach the mid-30s. That's Over 30 this outfit, Celsius. you must wear That's a set of mining coveralls, <laughs> waterproof safety boots, a hard hat, safety glasses, and a mining belt. All this gear is required to travel safely down into the mine. Everyone entering the mine must tag in so that there is a record on surface of who's underground at all times. The final piece of equipment you need before heading underground is a cap lamp. The battery pack attaches to the mining belt and the light attaches to the front of the hard hat. You join other Snow Lab staff to wait for the cage, the large elevator that brings people and materials to and from the surface. This is an it's a tight nickel squeeze mine. as you so descend 6,800 feet. Miners over two kilometers in just a few minutes. You experience 25 to 30 percent more air pressure at that depth, and the descent feels similar to flying in an airplane. And yet your ears do pop. Twenty percent larger, so instead of 15 psi, it's 8 more psi. Snow Lab is located at this depth to shield sensitive experiments from the cosmic radiation at the Earth's surface. Usually you're riding down the elevator like this because there's so many people around here. Once arriving at the 6800 level, watch your step as you enter the drift. The drift is the main part of the mine. It's important to keep your cap lamp on and to watch your step during the two kilometer walk from the cage to snow lab. Mile walk at 90 degrees Fahrenheit for overall mine. <laughs> snow lab is a clean lab, meaning dust and dirt must be kept to a bare minimum. Mine dust, in particular, can interfere with experiments if it gets into the lab That's area. That's called the car wash. For these reasons, strict cleanliness protocols are in place. 
Everything that enters the lab must be thoroughly cleaned. That includes people. The first step is to wash the mud and dust off your boots before entering the lab doors. As you step into the lab, you notice a temperature change immediately. The conditions in the lab are well regulated to keep a constant temperature and humidity. At this point, everyone must remove their hard hats and belts and hang them on the hooks along the wall. Remove your boots and safety glasses and place them on the shelves. Remember where you've placed your boots. And everything else too. The next step is to head to the underground dry. Upstairs for women, downstairs for men. There is a dirty side and a clean side to the dry, separated by showers. Anything that has been in the drift must remain on the dirty side. To ensure the lab stays as clean as possible, everyone showers to remove any remaining dust that may linger on skin or hair. You are provided with safety boots, a t-shirt, and clean room suit following your shower. These outfits remain underground and are washed in laundry facilities in the lab to eliminate the possibility of getting contaminated by mine dust in traveling to and from the surface. So you literally can't bring anything You also need to wear a, a hairnet, safety glasses, and hard hat in the lab. As you leave the dry and enter the lunchroom, everyone must tag in again to keep track of who is in the lab. The lunchroom is the heart of Snow Lab and also functions as the lab's refuge station. In case of an emergency, staff and visitors would congregate here. Scientists, staff, and visitors will spend eight hours underground, working on experiments, building the newest areas of the lab, and maintaining the facility. That's the form of shot creep. At the end of the day, you and the rest of the, the snow lab crew pack up and easily. head back to surface. This whole lab is maintained as a clean room, so they have a bunch of support staff that wipes it down on a rotating basis all the time. You don't really come out that fast. <laughs> The Snow Lab crew will be back, prepared to do the same thing all over again tomorrow. <sighs> <laughs> the original experiment at Snow Lab is called the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, and it was looking for solar neutrinos. Click. The more data Oops. you can use, the more Neither. you can revolutionize. <laughs> forgot that YouTube just plays the next thing. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. Yes? Uh, do you not suffer the bends, but <coughs> people have fainted in the hoist, and it's because of the air pressure difference, although it's not well understood why. But it's very rare. You just don't go down there like I am. You wouldn't go down there now because I have a congestion, and so I would probably not make it. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you faint, and you're all right, but... <clears throat> you have to be careful going to that depth. And it's physically very tiring because you see the overhead involved. You, it's not just going into a lab here. You know, you've got a, a kilometer and a half walk in a hot environment. You change everything. You know, then you get to work for eight hours and you get to come all out through that again. Long days. It's an eight hour, it's an eight hour working down there. If you're lucky. You're down there 10 hours, but if you're lucky you can get eight. It's probably closer to six okay, or seven. Okay, so tacked onto that is the preparation, the cleaning, and the shower. Correct. And, uh, yes. Okay. All right, let's thank Dan and uh, thank you.